And we are on. Okay, Father, let's go ahead and... Father, we thank you for this opportunity once again to come before you, sit and learn at your feet, Lord. We come... I have a teaching capacity, yes, but before you can teach anything, you have to be a student. I come as a student with my friends tonight. But just help us learn together whatever insights you have from us. Use whichever ones, whether it's me, whether it's Angela, whether it's James. I'm, I'm sure it'll be all of us to some degree, but just impart whatever you have to us. Lord, James is still on his way to be with us, but we pray that you keep him safe. And Lord, just everything will go according to your perfect will, no more or less. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, church government. This is a topic that, another one of those nuts and bolts type topics that people may think, Ugh, when they think they're going to study it. But when you, it's really a dynamic topic when you start going into the um, all the ins and outs of it and see God's hand in the way he does all this. The purpose of the church is to meet the needs of people and to teach the word of God. And I, I taught ministerial ethics to BTC2 last week. Oh, here comes James now. I'm going to put this on hold for a minute. Okay, <laughs> okay James has joined us. Say hi, James. Hello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the distinguished gentleman. <laughs> okay. Hey. Okay, welcome. Okay, we're uh, just talking about, we're just starting uh, in with the church government. Um, the purpose of the church is to meet the needs of the people and to teach the word of God. And one of the things I taught the uh, ministerial, ministerial ethics class last week was uh, if you want to go into ministry for any other reason than to glorify God and help people, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. You know. First Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God has set some in the church. This is important to remember. The church is not a building. In fact, church buildings didn't even exist for about the first 300 years of Christianity. The church is every born-again believer. The church, physically speaking, is just the st- structure that houses the church. I mean, you, we could say, like, you could say, I'm on my way to the church. That's fine. You know, we know what you mean. But actually, the building itself is a building. We're the church. Mm-hmm. It's only the church as much as we're, it's, we're using it for that purpose. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we were to ever be, uh, to relocate somewhere else, I mean, this could very easily become who knows what. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a brick and mortar and whatever else is goes beyond building it. But because it's used while we're here to worship God and spread the gospel, it's a church. I wish I had brought that book because that's exactly what the author was talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. If the church is a supernatural living organism established, empowered, and or created, established, empowered, and led by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, if you could look up these two scriptures, Angela, if you want to do Ephesians 1, 17 through 23, okay. and James, you can do Colossians 1, 9 through 18. And, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit and wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches and of the glory of this inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at, the, at, his, only, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Okay. And that's a really powerful statement to think that not only has he been seated in heavenly places, but spiritually speaking, we're also there with him. I mean, we will be there fully in person one day. But as far as God concern, God's concerned, we're here now. You ever uh, been going through a bad time? Somebody will say, well, keep looking up. Really, a better advice would say, keep looking down. You're seated with Jesus, and he's already above that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I heard Charles, Charles Gap say that one time, and it's always stuck with me. Okay. James, you want to do the Colossians passage now? 
Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> Colossians 1, uh, verse 9 through 18, <coughs> and it reads, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, and our wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power for our patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins he is the image of the invisible god the firstborn over all creation for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him consist all, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And you notice in reflecting how um, all things were ultimately created for Jesus' glory, but the thing it specifically zeroes in on is the church. That's where it all starts. The definition of organism, a living thing that grows, functions, and, repro and has reproduction ability, proper nutrition, is the word of God. And that's, that's important to realize that um, growth, function, and um, reproduction are all an important part of the church. It bothers me a little bit when they hear people say, well, I just want to go to a small church. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, our church is not that big yet, but, and a church has to start somewhere, but somebody who just wants a church to stay small, I think shows a serious lack of vision. I mean, a, a healthy church has people going out sharing their faith and bringing people in. A healthy church will be a growing church. The church is a New Testament revelation. The New Testament word is ecclesia, which means um, called out ones. That's a really special thing. We are God's children called out of the world to be a part of his family. Now this word ecclesia, you occasionally hear debates come up that I really think are a matter of semantics on exactly when did the church start. Now the Old Testament saints were described as an ecclesia. They were, they were a called out group of people. So some people say, well the church actually started back to the Old Testament. Others say, well the church started with the um, ministry of Christ because you know, Christ called the disciples to be called out from the world. But both of those things are true. You know, so again, you and I, I used to know a pastor that would really get agitated about this, but the most, the most, more traditional in belief is that the church started on the day of Pentecost. And again, which one of those is true? Yes, <laughs> there was a called out group of people in the Old Testament. Jesus did call a group of people of people out to follow him, and that led up to the formation of the New Testament church at Pentecost. So one of those, none of those things negate the other. You understand what I'm saying? The church is physical, is spiritual in character, but it is also a human organization. And that is where a lot of people miss it. You hear on one hand people um, talk about how full of hypocrites the church are. But then they'll talk about too how unloving Christians are because they don't really receive people in with all their flaws and things like that. And again, there has to be a happy medium there. Yes, all are welcome, but yeah, God loves us as we are, but loves us too much to keep leave us that way. Mm -hmm. So the church needs to be welcoming of people as they are, but we, we need to, it needs to be understood that as you grow in Jesus there, your life does transform that way. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 28. Does someone read that? I'll tag team with you guys uh, on the reading tonight, if you don't mind, because I've read too much, my, my uh, throat gets dry. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12. Yes, sir, 12 through 28. But as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and how and have all been made to drink into one spirit. But in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, 
where it would be the hearing. If the whole were hearing, yeah, you know, the whole were hearing, where would the where would, where would the smelling be? Excuse me. But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. And if there were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head of the, to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our, un and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Okay. Mm -hmm. Keep going, I'm interrupt you. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it, or, with, or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in the village and individually. And if God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. You know, that's such a beautiful analogy, the way it uses the, the body to describe that. And, you know, we come from so many different backgrounds, different just life experience backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, different experiences. Everybody is unique. And God has, even before any of that started, formed us in that with the mother's womb and gifted us with what he had us to do. And whatever the gifting may be is, like people say, is ordained ministry the highest calling? Only if that's what you're called to do. But if it's not, I mean, I'm, you guys may, I don't know what you guys have in mind as far as your individual ministry callings. And if you feel you are called to full-time ministry, so by all means, pursue it. But if he's called you to be a school teacher or a construction worker, mm -hmm. do that with all your heart and mm -hmm. serve God in whatever lay capacity he calls you to do. And for, for you, that is the highest calling. Mm -hmm. It's an individual thing. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever job you do, uh, you are a vital part of the body and you are part of the glue that holds it all together. I mean, if you work in children's ministry, the children's, children's pastor doesn't show up, the whole church is not going to work right. If the person who makes the visitor snacks, if they don't show up, then something all the important is going to be missing. Every piece of the body is important. And wherever God's got you, if you're the pastor or if you're scrubbing toilets, do it with all your heart. Because if you because you never know where that's going to lead. There's one famous uh, healing evangelist, Ed Dufresne, I don't know if you ever heard of him or not, he actually passed away just a few months ago. I've heard his testimony before, but he talked about uh, how he grew up in a Catholic background, but it really was not really devout in it and say was sitting in a bar one day and God spoke to him and says I want to I want to use you to preach the gospel all around the world and he goes next round's on me everybody I'm going to be a priest <laughs> 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 but he wound up I don't remember all the twists and turns that got him there but he, he got born again got spirit filled he walked to his pastor and says reporting for duty and his job again he started off scrubbing toilets but wound up with a ended up with a worldwide ministry. So again, you never know where things are, where things are going to lead. What was his name again? Ed Dufresne, D-U-F-R-E-S-N-E. -E. But uh, it's you, you hear a lot of different stories like that. And if you're trying, even in the secular world, if you're trying to break into a certain field, most of them will tell you, you know, get in ground level, just do whatever you can. Mm -hmm. You know? Okay. Oh, I wish this pulpit was a little bit bigger. <laughs> Three representations of the church in scripture. The universal church composed of all believers of all ages who are united in faith by faith in Christ Jesus. That's that and now the universal church is not a denomination, any one denomination um, that tells you we are the, the true church is either a cult or is on a dangerous path to becoming one. First Corinthians twelve thirteen, we are united by spirit, we are united in spirit to every other born again believer on the planet or in heaven. We are united by confession, by the faith that we profess. We are united by destination. We are citizens of the kingdom now, on our way to being the ultimate kingdom, ultimate manifestation of that. But the local church, 
is a body of professed believers in Christ who identify with a local body in one locality for the purpose of worship and fellowship. Acts 2, 42, 47 is an example of the local church. Now, if you notice, many epistles are directly addressed to local churches, the church in Corinth, the church in Rome, the church in Ephesus, whatever that may be. I mean, whichever specific church may be, in, may be uh, the subject. But it can be a small company in a home. As I mentioned earlier, church buildings didn't come around till for about 300 years after the church started. Initially, they either made ministers and members' homes, or uh, they would, because of persecution, they had to meet in caves. They sometimes they would meet. It's interesting. You know where the, the tradition of churches having peak ceilings came from? You know, cathedral ceilings. Mm -hmm. uh, churches would meet in an overturned boat, and the, the shape of the boat. Uh, kind of stuck and some churches do that to this day. Oh, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. A group of churches in a country or nation, again like I just talked about, uh, Corinth, Rome, Colossus, Ephesus, Philippi, whatever. Mm -hmm. Knoxville, obviously. <laughs> mm -hmm. The individual church. The indivi are individual examples of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the church. I am the church. We're all the church. If mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have heard me when, when I've gotten to teach in the sanctuary, but most of the time when I do that, I, when the service is over, I use a benediction I got when I was going to the Methodist church. Now you may leave this building, but you could never leave this church. For where you are, there the church is. Go in peace, sin no more, love God, serve his people always. The first time I ever heard a pastor do that, that really stuck with me. I'm thinking, that's really saying a lot. And I, I, I like to incorporate that in when I get to minister. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28, we've already read that, but the Greek word for church is ekklesia for the word, uh, from the word ek ekaleo, meaning called out of the world. Again, we've already touched on that. Ekaleo is also translated as the chosen ones. If the church is the called out ones, we must ask, who is calling us? Who is being called? What are we being called out of, I would add. What's the contrast of where we're being called out of and where, we're being, where are we being called to? 1 Corinthians 12, 28, said God has set therefore God is the one doing the calling okay would someone read look at um, Ephesians 4 verses 8 through 11 and this is a verse we're going to be referring back to a number of times tonight Ascended on high, he that captivity captive, and gave gift and gave gifts to men. And, uh, verse eleven reads. You go ahead and read the oh, eight through eleven. Eight through 11. Oh. Yeah. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And he descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave him to be apostles, prophets, evangelists. And some pastors and teachers. Yeah. Okay. If you want to notice that after those for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, there's if you read the King James, there's what you find what you call the unholy comma. God has gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors and teachers. But let me look that, that up. I want to make sure I'm quoting it the right, um, using the right wording on that. What for verse eleven? Yeah. And he gave some, pro some comma, apostles, mm -hmm. and some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Greek language has no punctuation. These commas were added by the translators. A better way to word this would be, he gave the ministry gifts, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, without the commas. The ministry equips us for the work of the ministry. And then the semicolon, is it, do y'all have that in yours? Because this is from the King James online. Mm -hmm. well, yours, does yours have semicolon? Yeah, but I mean, that's just... It's uh, that, an afterthought. Yeah, that's just for, you know, to yeah. you know, designate between the offices. The comma I was focusing on, the comma I was focusing on when verse 12... He gave us the ministry for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. It's a continual thought. It shouldn't be broken up by commas. It's not just the ministry's responsibility to do, to do the ministry. They equip us so we can also do the ministry. We should be the ones helping the church to grow. We should be the ones helping others to grow in the faith. Whatever, again, whatever form that takes. 
Therefore, God chooses the ministry gifts and sets them in the first. Paul clarifies that men do not make apostles, only God does. Ephesians 4.11 doesn't mention deacons, elders, or bishops as ministry gifts, so they are not ministry gifts set by God. They are chosen by men. And we're going to be talking about this later on. Do you have some examples? No, I was just looking at part D like this. Yes. But... um, we're going to be looking at uh, elders and deacons later, uh, but one of the, it's important to remember that uh, you don't necessarily have to have a special calling for God to serve in those capacities. If you just have a desire to do it and you meet the qualifications, then certainly you can uh, look into do, being able to do that. And again, we'll be talk, talking more about that as we go along. But some people think, well, they have to have a certain calling to do those to do those ministry works. But sometimes the calling comes to the form of just having the desire to do that. And again, we're going to be talking about that as we go along. The one who does the calling has authority over the one who calls. Ephesians 1:22 and 23, Jesus is the head of the church, therefore he has authority over the ministry. Yes, he chooses because God gave him, God the Father gave him that authority. The church should be an oasis of love, a place of refuge for the lost. And you can often tell that as soon as you walk in the door. Amen. I remember the church I used to go to... Um, there's a lady named Beverly that was that went there. As far as, as far as I know, still does. But Beverly's just one of the most bubbling, over kind-hearted people you would ever meet. And of course, her ministry gift was right there, being the door greeter. <laughs> you know, you'd walk her to the door. Come on, honey, let me give you a big old hug. You know, and I don't know how many people stayed in the church there because they Beverly gave them that first impression. In fact, I know a guy that actually sought her out and said, "Please lay hands on me that I can have that spirit of kindness that you have." Mm-hmm. You, you know, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's important to note too let's look at John chapter 13 this is this section of the this these few chapters in here are one of my favorite sections of the gospels John 13 verses 34 and 35 a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you so that you may also love one another by this shall all men know you are my disciples because you belong to XYZ denomination because you have more tongue talking and jumping and shouting than other churches do. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Because you have a certain worship style, worship style of music or whatever. No, it doesn't say that. It says people will know you are my disciples because of your love for one another. That trumps all the, all the other things. Not that the form of worship you have and the speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts are important. I'm not putting any of that down, but all that is secondary if you don't have the love. Um, let's see. And uh, backing up here, this is a really challenging uh, uh, commandment from the words of Jesus. He says, A new commandment I gave unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. We think in terms of loving our neighbor as ourself, but Jesus didn't stop at loving others as himself. He loved others more than he loved himself. That's really challenging. I know I certainly don't live up to it. Amen. Yes, I Amen. And that's. Love that surpasses, you know, beyond what our mind can, sure. you know, gravitate. You exactly. Know, just take hold. Yeah, that's real love. Mm-hmm. <laughs> real love. Lily came up to me just yesterday and says, "Daddy, what's love?" And you know, that's one of those things. It's really hard. To, it's hard to explain to an adult, let alone a five-year-old. But she says, "I think love is being really happy with somebody all the time." And I said, well, no, not really, honey. You can love people even when they make you really sad. Mm-hmm. Love is just not how they make you feel. Love is loving someone no matter what, even when they may really hurt you. Mm-hmm. And but yeah, I was glad she asked that. I don't know that she really understood what I was saying then, but I'm glad that, that I'm glad she's thinking in those terms. Mm-hmm. The church should be an organization so the spirit can have order to work with. Um, would someone like to read First uh, Corinthians 14? Verses 33 and verse and verse uh, 40. 13, you say. Yeah. Thir- no, I'm sorry. Verse chapter 13, verse 33, and then skip to verse 40. Chapter. Uh, yeah. You said verse. Uh, 
14. Yeah, verse 33 and then verse 40. Both in 1 Corinthians 14. Oh, first, okay. Verse 33? Yes, and then verse 40. <laughs> okay, let's see what it says. Uh, this is from King James. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And then 40? Yeah. Let all things be done decently and in order. Sure, so church is, uh, church is a an organization that is to have order in the way it functions. It's not just everybody do things their own way. A church to have a foundation that will draw the people together in unity. The word is the supreme authority over all matters. You know, and for us that goes without saying. But when you look at uh, church history, and I think studying church history is important in, in uh, how we understand the Bible, just how believers have approached scriptures through the years. You have two terms that you you can see. uh, One is called the regulative principle, which says we will not do anything in church that doesn't come from the Bible. Okay? I agree with that principle. But you have to be careful in how you implement that because you can get into some really flaky ideas. Like, the Bible never says the church should have electricity. But are we sinning because we're not doing this in the dark? <laughs> the Bible never says a church to have carpets. It doesn't say it should have furniture. It doesn't say it should have bathrooms. It doesn't say it should have water fountains. You know, so if you get into that kind of thing, you get into legalism. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you go to a church uh, that, for example, is very strict in following the uh, regulative principle, generally the music will be strictly singing the psalms set to music because they would say, that's the type of only type of scene that's described specifically in the Old Testament. I mean, in the New Testament. Technically speaking, that's true. But I heard a pastor talking about this. He asked someone. He says, "So, since the Psalms are off the Old Testament, is it a sin to sing a song about directly mentions Jesus?" And the, the that guy said, "Yes." So that's what I'm saying. It's a good principle, but you have to be careful how you implement it. Now. What I think is a more common sense approach is what they call the normative principle. The normative principle is if something is not specifically forbidden in the Bible, then we have some more liberty and flexibility that goes along with it. I tend to, I'm more comfortable with that myself. Going back to the Protestant Reformation, um, Martin Luther and John Calvin were a couple of the biggest names that come out of that. Martin Luther was a uh, normative principle guy. He, when, even though he broke with the Catholic Church, he didn't feel the need to do away with uh, all Catholic traditions. In fact, some today people today call Lutherans Catholic light. Well, most Lutherans probably wouldn't like that label, but <laughs> if you go to Lutheran Church today, it's still very formal, very uh, ritualistic. It's very similar in a lot of ways to a Catholic service. Luther just, he said, he got rid of the parts of the Catholic doctrine they felt were against Scripture, but he kept the rest. Mm-hmm. John Calvin, on the other hand, was a regular principle kind of guy. Some of your Presbyterian churches can be traced back to Calvin, Reformed churches, and things like that. If you go to a church like that, well, I say Presbyterian, there's a lot of different kinds of Presbyterian churches, but if someone who is uh, very tied to Calvinistic roots, they're a lot more scaled down, and the, there's not as much formalism. Again, you probably hear the uh, psalm sung, for example. But it's again, that's just a way you, when you say the scripture is the final authority, you have to again clarify how you put that into action. A church should have a vision. You should know where you're going. You can know what you'll accomplish and how you will accomplish it. You should write that vision down. So that goes without saying. A church should be a word church, a local church which establishes the Bible as doctrine and regu- regulation rather than the tradition of men. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit here too because this word tradition is another word that sends up red flags as soon as we hear it. And yes, what they're saying here is true. Our doctrine and our regulation is based on the Bible, not by traditions of men. But that doesn't mean tradition doesn't have its place. When Jesus said, you err you because you uh, make the word of God uh, done effect by your tradition, he wasn't saying all tradition is bad. He was just saying, keep it in its place. It doesn't trump what the word of God says. 
In fact, at 2 Thessalonians 2.15, if you want to write that and look it up later, Paul says, keep the traditions you learned from me. So there is a place for tradition in this Christian life. And I'm going to give you, let's you a little secret here. All churches have traditions. Even the churches that beat their chest the loudest about we don't do tradition, they have traditions. <laughs> Even being against tradition can become a tradition. Because let me tell you what tradition is. Tradition is just the means you use to pass something from one generation to the next. Whether it's the gospel or whether it's your Aunt Gladys's gravy bowl. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know there, there are traditions like you have traditions the way you observe holidays. That's yeah. one of the ways you pass your family identity down from one generation to the other. And the way we proclaim the gospel, the, the way we preach it, the kind of music we use, all that is tradition. And we really, we're making new traditions every time we open the church doors. So we need to make sure we, yes, we keep tradition in its place. Tradition, the word is master, tradition is servant. We keep tradition in its place, but we need to make sure the traditions we are setting, are the, that's where the standards we're setting for the future. We need to make sure we're setting good ones. So it's not a matter, are you going to have tradition or not? It's a matter of what kind of tradition you're going to have and what place are you going to give it in your life. The church should be a Bible training t- church, training the body of Christ for the work of the ministry. We already touched on that. The church should be should the church should offer evangelistic outreach, teaching the word, doing the work, touching the world. Okay, let's go back to Mark chapter sixteen, and I'll go ahead and I'll read it. Mark sixteen. Yeah, Mark sixteen, fifteen through twenty. And he said, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And by name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with two tongues, they shall take up servants. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay heads on the sick and they will recover. So, and then, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and, was, and sat on the right hand of God. And they, they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord were he with them confirming the word with signs following amen so this the great commission the great co-mission it's the mission is a co-mission that we share with Jesus the church his body is to carry out that gospel to the world okay moving on to section two government government is in Greek kubernesis definition to steer guide pilot direct exercise authority Government is, is the continuous exercise of authority over something. It's having authoritative direction and control. Government also establishes moral conduct, behavior, and direct discretion. It is a former system or rule which is a collection of, or, or group of people are to be governed or, in order to keep, the, keep order among themselves, provide certain common services, and to protect themselves from attack by hostile countries. Okay, we're going to start getting into some definitions and forms of church government. And I'm going to put a little caveat here. I, you know, I wrote some of the notes, I'm sure, but I didn't write this actual teaching. And to be honest, I don't completely agree with some of the conclusions that this mm-hmm. syllabus draws to. And they, it does use some terminology I'm not completely comfortable with. Mm-hmm. You know, no disrespect to whoever did it, but I will be, I'll clarify things as I feel the need to as we go along. Democracy and theocracy. Democracy is a bad rule system, one bad, one vote. Theocracy is where God rules. That's true, but it's a little bit simplistic. God's church is not a democracy, true, but that doesn't mean that individual members don't have a voice. You remember when they had to replace Judas with Matthias in Acts 1, the whole church came together and they were involved in that. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 8 23 it talks about how the whole church sent Titus as representative mm-hmm. so that doesn't mean that individual members of the church don't have a voice but to say the church is a theocracy true God, Jesus is the head of the church and we recognize that but he is ruling it through human government I think a better word would be representative theocracy because Yes, we recognize him as the ruler. We seek his word, his will, and everything we do. But again, we're still human beings. And, you know, we, we, you know, it is possible for us to make mistakes, but we are doing our best to represent the way we can. For, but, you know, for example, would we, would we say we're giving our offerings to God? 
that doesn't mean that God pulls the roof off the church and sticks his hand down to the sanctuary and forced to physically drop it into. I don't know about you, but I'd freak out if I saw that happen. <laughs> but we, he, what we're doing is we're giving our offerings to the, his body, the church, for the leadership to steward on his behalf in doing the work of the ministry. You understand where I'm going? Okay. You, and, uh, you, does that sound right to you? I, I just I felt I need to word that a little bit different than the outline did. Now, to carry democracy in the church is to ensure two things will happen. Death will come when you bring man's rule and failure will come. That's true. You can't, there's no place for politics in church leadership, but that's what taking a vote on everything can turn into. But again, at the same time, that doesn't mean that you don't take into consideration the feelings of the congregation. You know, again, I can't speak, I've never seen this come up at our church, so I, I, I you know, pastor may feel differently about this. If he does, I'm open to correction, but you know, if you're going to paint the room back here a certain color and say, well, Angel, what color would you like? James, what color would you like? Get people's opinion. I don't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, but again, the pastor and the church leadership have the final rule in that, have the final say-so. And once the decision is made, then we need to go along with that. Mm-hmm. You'd be surprised how many churches have had some major tension over stuff like that, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's just, you know, it brings, you know, back to vision. Exactly. Back, everything it, like that when get into small exactly you know, strivings about you know fighting over the color of the carpet you exactly know, and stuff like so that so you have everything neutral exactly <laughs> you know, that's, that's something that we don't do in the kingdom you know yeah, mm-hmm. sure exactly we, we shouldn't it does happen yeah mm-hmm. but uh, let's see um, forms of church government oh wait Five reasons we need the gift of government in the church. Matthew 18, 18 through 20. I'm going to back up and read that for church discipline. This is an area I think we, I personally think we need more teaching on because there's not a good, there's not proper understanding of it. Verily I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Um, it, Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done of them by my Father which is in heaven. Now we think of this in terms of binding Satan and getting agreement for our prayers, and there's a place for that. But really the context of this, if you read the whole chapter, is if your brother sins against you, go to him. If, if, he, won't be, um, if he won't hear you, take two or more witnesses. If he still won't listen, take him, to, take him before the church. It's the whole the context of it is a, an incident of church discipline when necessary. Mm-hmm. It's similar to in a Corinthian church where the man was having the affair with his mother-in-law, and Paul had to say, "Deliver this man to Satan." Mm-hmm. And but of course, it the man did repent and come back. Mm-hmm. But it leads up to if this verse seventeen, if this is after all the other steps have been gone through, if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man, a, a publican, or a tax collector, which is on par with being a heathen. <laughs> but uh, that this is the same thing. It's when to, to, to turn someone over to Satan means to cut him off from the church and from the blessing that goes along with that. Mm-hmm. You want to live for the devil? Go out, let the devil kick him around a little bit, and see how he likes it. And in the when the man in the Corinthian church that's what brought him back to repentance and when he did it wasn't a matter of prolongance Paul says receive him back as a brother now mm-hmm. it's not to be mean the person's given every opportunity to repent but it goes back to uh, well churches are just full of hypocrites if this was practiced consistently you wouldn't have that problem so much but when people when churches do take proper disciplinary measures they come across as being well churches are judgmental and churches are unloving no, if this is done right, that's the most loving thing you can do. Mm-hmm. You're stopping a person from going to, going to hell. Mm-hmm. That's the most loving, compassionate thing you can do. Okay, forms of church government, the gray area, and I'm glad I'm glad it used this term. Because of the gray area of church government involves the office of deacons, elders, and bishops, and who chooses them. Note the different types of polity, government structures. Remember, schisms happen when there's disagreement, division, no harmony, split. Division over organized groups, sects, parties formed by splits, resulting of different opinions and doctrines. Okay. Uh, something I'm going to I want you to notice as we look over these is most of these groups will will can give you scriptural reasons for why they have the form of government they do, like the ones that have plurality of elders can show you scripture that they feel supports that. Churches that have one pastor 
as the overall head of the church. Can you give scriptural reasons to support that? Now, someone could just say, well, this is the Bible way to do it. Yes and no. When you uh, study the Bible, there you can divide the Bible into two different categories, prescriptive and descriptive. A prescriptive part of the Bible would be telling you that this is how something is to be done in all cases. And there are a lot of, a lot of the Bible that is that. Descriptive means it's describing something that happens, but that's not necessarily prescribing that's how it should be done. For example, the Bible describes Job's wife to him to curse God and die. Obviously, that's not something it's prescribing for us to do. <laughs> now, in some cases, there are prescriptive passages about how the church is to be governed, and that is something we're to follow. But in other cases, it goes back to, uh, to normative principle. The, it may be describing a church that is ministering to a certain group of people in a certain setting, in certain situations, dealing with certain issues. And in that setting, yes, a certain form of government may be best for this group, but it may be a different form of government may be proper for this group, unless, unless the Bible specifically says this is how you're to do it. I personally think we have maybe some flexibility with that. You understand what I'm saying? Now we're going to talk first about the well, different. Before, well, before I go into um, Episcopalian and the other forms of government, a lot of these vary among denominational structures, and denominations are a strange animal. Mm-hmm. Yes, denominations are not specifically biblical, but when you see how the church is has. Some of the issues the church had to deal with over the years, like Martin Luther we talked about a while ago, he had to raise some important truth that had been neglected by the established church. In his case, that, that you are justified through faith alone, not by going through indulgences and all the other things the Catholic Church was doing. Okay, when he was rejected, he didn't have a, he wasn't trying to start a whole other church. He wanted to, he wanted to stay Catholic. But it became necessary for it to start another group in other groups that have it's not new truth there is there is no new truth truth's always been there but truth that may have been neglected by the religious establishment on down through John Wesley a lot of the teachings he taught about uh, spiritual growth and growth in grace the the established church didn't want to hear that so the Methodist church kind of came out of that the Anabaptists which they taught that infant baptism was unscriptural and that adult believers to be baptized a lot of them were martyred for teaching that. But again, it be- when the establishment wouldn't accept it, it became necessary to start a new group of the Pentecostals. The same way when the Pentecostals started teaching the baptism and the gifts of the Spirit, the established church still doesn't like that. <laughs> a lot of them don't. But again, it's denominations may not be specifically biblical per se, but I don't know of another way that they could have could have done what they did. You understand? So I'm not going to say that denominations don't have their place. I, in an ideal world, they wouldn't be necessary. But we're not dealing with ideal situations. But again, the church government issue, you know, is, is one of the big things that will vary from denomination to denomination. Episcopalian, this type of church government has the chief ministers. Chief ministers are bishops in control. Bishop means episcopos in Greek, oversight, superintendent, the overseer. I'm going to get some scriptures for that. Other ministers are presbyters, priests, and deacons. It is a hierarchical, monarchical, monarch, monarch, I can't read that, monarchical structure. The pope or king is the sole ruler. In Episcopal Church, the Archbishop of Canterbury is considered the leader. An example of this type of government can be seen in the following churches, Roman Catholic, Anglican, Episcopalian, Methodist, Lutheran, African, Methodist, Episcopal. Brief history, after the apostles preached the gospel in places like Philippi, Ephesus, Corinth, Rome, many were converted to the Christian faith, but these all had backgrounds as Jews or Gentiles who knew nothing about the Old Testament or God. The elders had to teach the Gentiles these concepts and how to function as a communion of saints. They encountered the problem of heresies entering the congregation. Paul and Barnabas taught in Antioch in Acts 14, but in Acts 15, one certain Christians went in and taught the congregation the need for circumcision to be saved, and the elders had to face these issues. The heresies and the leadership and their the leadership on their own after the original apostles had died. Remember, the Bible was not available to the Church of Acts, the early church, or, the, or for Christians in general for thousands of years. 
Each book or epistle had to be hand copied, meaning they were very scarce among the congregations, limiting the congregations in their ability to personally defend the faith. And the responsibility and pressure on the elders led to three developments. The elders were elevated above the laity of the congregation. The more gifted, educated elders became leaders above other elders. Over time, there was a division between laity and clergy, and less, do- the no- less knowledgeable and the more knowledgeable. Ministers were elevated above all elders. The word elder is a pretty broad term. It points out all ministers are elders, but not all elders are, are ministers in the fivefold sense. In Acts 14.23 and Titus 1.5, we see the apostles appointed elders in every church. In 1 Corinthians 5.17, there's a distinction between elders who rule and those who labor in the word and doctrine. Focus came to rest on the minister, the teaching elder, which elevated him to above the ruling elders. This elevation was helped by the minister as the public face of the congregation, visible, known, and official. The minister had the books and knowledge to defend scripture from heresies. The minister was the one who was arrested in times of persecution, causing people to respect him for his suffering. Eventually the term elder vanished from these churches and the minister overseeing other ministers was called bishop. The minister was considered to be the elder. The bishop's authority expanded. The bishop became the ruler of the church in the town, but also became the ruler over leaders, priests of churches in smaller towns. Countries were divided into dioceses or groups of churches, with the bishop having jurisdiction over the churches and the priests reported to the bishop. The Bishop of Rome eventually became known as the Pope to the Catholic faith with an authority structure of priests, prelates, cardinals, and bishops submitting to the leadership of the Pope. This leaves the parish priest with no decision-making ability for the congregation. The Pope bases his leadership on the scripture, Matthew 16 and John 21. You can mark that and read it on your own. The authority of the Bible is replaced by one man's interpretation of the Pope. The First Vatican Council of 1871 declared the Pope's word to be infallible. And that was part of the problem, that people were not allowed to read the Bible for themselves. Some Protestant churches have an Episcopal church structure but not, do not submit to the Pope. Various denominations such as the Anglican, Episcopal, Lutheran, and Orthodox churches do not regard the Pope as head of the church but do recognize his superior, the superiority of presiding bishops and bishops above the parish priests. Apostolic succession, simply stated, is a doctrine that teaches that the religious authority and mission conferred by Jesus to the Apostle Peter and other apostles had come down through an unbroken succession of bishops. The scriptural basis for this doctrine is found in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 16. That's when Jesus tells Peter that upon this rock I will build my church. Catholics would say that rock is Peter. We would say that we, you know what the events leading up to this when Peter he says Peter who do you say I am Peter says thou art the Christ the son of the living God we would say that was the rock the church is built on his profession of faith that Jesus is the Christ not Peter himself but that's one of the important differences between uh, Catholics and Protestants the Roman Catholic Church continues the apostolic succession and to recognize the superiority of the Pope other denominations such as the Anglican Church continue the succession but reject the Pope's rule other denominations, such as Lutheran and Methodist churches, recognize the superiority of bishops, but have not followed the apostolic succession and do not recognize the Pope. I know when I was a Methodist, and I'm assuming it's still this way, uh, the Knoxville Methodist churches are under the, the Holston Conference. And if I remember right, the Holston Conference uh, contains part of Tennessee and I think two other states. And the bishop oversees the Methodist churches in that area. Now, the individual... Er- cities like there is a Knoxville district superintendent and the different cities have that. Um, I, the, the, when I was going to the Methodist church the bishop was a man named uh, Kern Utzler. I met him a time or two. Presbyterian. The elders presbyters are in charge of the church. The elder board usually considering a 3, 7, or 12 men makes every decision of the church. The elder board is superior to the pastor, or they have equal authority with the pastor. Thus, the pastor has little or no actual authority. He is there to minister the word only, but has no authority to lead the church. Example of the Presbyterian government are seen in the Presbyterian Reformed. It says Pentecostal. Some Pentecostal churches, but not all, have that form of government. Holiness, Friends, Mennonites, and many non-denominational churches. Presbyterians hold that both the Old and New Testament reveal the church rule is to be by the elders. Exodus 3.16, God instructs Moses to assemble together the elders. And you see other scriptural um, 
references you can study on your own. Therefore, Presbyterian church government contests that apostles were not seeking new structure, but were building on the known foundation. Martin Bucer and John Calvin and were, Cal, John Calvin worked to develop this polity, believing this was scripturally and historically accurate. They believe Christ is the head of the church and that he rules by the office of all believers, specifically through the elders. They said that Christ assigned this task of teaching and preaching to the elders. Preaching and church discipline are the two keys that open and close the kingdom of heaven. And while the power of these two keys is given to the congregation, Matthew 18, 17, which we just read, is to be exercised by the elders. And then again, there's some other, um, there's some other scriptures you can uh, study want to take time to look to. 1 Timothy 5.17, Presbyterians believe that the ruling elders have the decision-making power, not the minister. The Presbyterian form of government was not as successful in Geneva under Calvin's rule as it was in France, Germany, Netherlands, and Scotland. Calvinists, Calvin's foundation for the Reformed or Presbyterian Church recognized the fourfold ministry, pastor, doctor, teacher, deacon, and elder. And one of the problems with the way that Calvin's group uh, was... Um, doing things in Europe is sometimes there tended to be too much interaction with the local government and getting that done. It was, I think, too much connection between church and state and in that case and other times since then it has a history of getting people burned at the stake. So obviously not something that that's not, that was not a very bright period in church history. So it seemed like back then it's a lot of Division and strife. Sure. Know, mm-hmm. Causing people, like you said, to burn to sure. the state. Sure. Oh, yeah, it was. All that, you know, bickering and, you know, going back and forth about, oh, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, and there's no common ground. There's sure. There's no, you know, we want a cord. No sure. Mm-hmm. Cord, so. Yeah, it, it can, I mean, de- religion is the most dangerous thing there is. So, 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 so. I mean, you think about it today, how much, how many of the wars in the world now could be traced back to that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, it's a matter of that, yes, we're to be passionate after the truth. We have to be humble enough to admit we don't know it all. You Amen. Know? Amen. 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 Presbyterian churches are independent of each other, but they are connected by the same form of government. The local congregation elects its session, which governs its affairs. The teaching elder is chosen and chosen by the congregation and leads the session. The teaching elder is ordained by the presbytery. The presbytery consists of teaching and ruling elders from a group of congregations over which it exercises its jurisdictions. Above the presbytery is the General Assembly. Because of this, the plurality of elders and rulership, they believe that there is no room for dictatorship and that no one individual makes all the binding decisions of the church. Again, I can see the concern there. I've, got, I've, seen, I've seen it happen. I, I have a friend here in town that was going to a church that had been there for a long time and the pastor just sold the church property out from under the church. So to have some accountability there is wise. You know, and we'll, we'll be talking more about all those farms as we go. Congregational. The congregational form of government came into being approximately 200 years ago about the time the United States was established. Those who came to America seeking freedom were tired of living under a king and wanted a voice in their political government. This thought process was carried over into the church, and they also wanted a voice in their church government. As a result, they brought into the church the same kind of democratic government they had established in their new nation. In the congregational form of government, every action taken by the church must be voted on by the people. That, that one seems like it would get really monotonous to me. The pastor has one vote just like everyone else. The governing power in this form of government rests entirely with the people. The body of members in each local church have the autonomy or decision-making power. In this form of government, the majority rules. Some examples are Baptist Assembly of God, Church of God, Christ, and Congregationalist churches. Modern Congregationalism began in the 1500s in England with John Wycliffe and his followers called the Lollards, who assembled together in the woods to hear the Bible read in their own language, not Latin. When the progressive, progressing Reformation movement, people began to push for more forms of the church. By 1597, people were meeting separately from the Church of England. Many of these meetings were stopped and the people were arrested for illegal religious worship. Again, that's what we were just talking about. They were called separatists. Many were martyred, hung, and died in prison for the worship. In 1620, some of the separatists who had fled, fled to Holland sailed to New England in the Mayflower. These were the pilgrims. They established the Congregationalist Church in the New England, which grew as more pilgrims came to the country. 
While the separate is separated from the church, the Puritans attempt to reform it from within to purify it. During the English Civil War, the Westminster Confession of Faith was produced, which remains today as the Declaration of Reformed Faith for both Presbyterians and Congregationalists. Congregationalists hold that Christ is the head of the church and that all are priests, and that's true. Each church is separate in its own body and not subject to bishops or elders. The churches are run by the church boards or committees made up of members of the congregation. The congregation and the pastor vote on all issues and actions of the church. We pay the parking lot, hire a secretary, purchase a new piano, etc. In some Baptist churches, deacons are often a ruling body of the church. An annual meeting is held to involve the entire congregation, which can occasionally get verbal and or physical. Now, I have a good friend who is a deacon in a large Baptist church. Now, he's told me some more stories. <laughs> you know, it, it does happen. He told me one time they were going to have a meeting on something they expected to be... Um, controversial and he says he's going to call the WWE and get him to send some announcers down to <laughs> cover the action. I mean, I laughed. That was not funny, but the way he said it was humorous. In, in, independent, in the independent form of government, the pastor is given complete charge of the church. It's governed much like a corporate business. The pastor is like the president and the assistant pastors, elders in some churches, are like vice presidents. The pastor is likened to the CEO or president. Again, I don't like that analogy. Because I don't like thinking of our pastor or any pastor as being Donald Trump. <laughs> the assistant pastor is likened to the vice president. Depar de directors, department heads, over deacons, choir ushers, sound ministers, administration are likened to managers. There is only one head of the organization, the pastor. In the independent form of government, the pastor holds the autonomy or decision-making authority. And there are also lower levels of authority under him or helps ministry. In James 5.14, we're familiar with that. Um, passage the elders the sick are to call for the elders of the church you know it says elders uh, elders plural uh, in church singular there can be several elders in any one church the pastor calls and appoints the elders or assistant ministers notice that the elders are the one going to the sick to minister to them thus they are, are ministers appointed by the pastor to do the job function allowing the pastor to pray and study the word they're an extension of the pastor's ministry and we're going to be talking about that a little bit more as we go the independent form of government began the book of Acts when Paul, Peter, John, Silas, and Barnabas established churches independent of Jewish sects. And there's some other scriptures you can read on your own. Some of the analogies here, God created the family and church for one man rule. God's formula in the church is the same. One God, one man, no confusion. That's true, but again... We are talking about a fallible human being, and there have been a lot of cases of abuse there, you know. God's formula does not produce a lack of accountability, although one man is responsible. He, the pastor, is accountable to God. Again, I don't believe our pastor would agree with that, because he's talked just recently about you know, how he's accountable to Pastor Coles in Nashville and Bishop Butler, you know, so there's, account there's accountability in his office. Mm -hmm. And to just say, well, I'm accountable to God, so, again like the man who sold the church out from under his people. That's, you're, you're setting yourself up for some problems if you think that way. Whatever applies to the universal church also applies to the local church because the pastor holds the same position in the local church that Jesus does in the universal church. Again, I think that's saying more than scripture actually does. Yes, the pastor is an under-shepherd, but to say, like, we worship Jesus. We don't worship the pastor. Jesus is perfect. The pastors are not. You know, he, all we ministers... Our heart is to serve God, but we can make mistakes like anybody else can. Husband, wife, Christ church, head body. Christ is the head of the universal church. Marriage, husband is head of the marriage and has responsibility of the authority. Human body, head is the control center of the body. Body doesn't function without the head. That's true. God's design is one, has one source of authority. The universal church has one head. Marriage has one head. Body has one head. But, you know, in fairness to um, to the outline it does talk here about the strengths and weaknesses of that form like any other form of government six advantages of having an independent form of government it allows the church, local church the freedom to determine its own responsibility toward the plans and programs of the pastor it allows the local church to ascertain the will of God for itself and to fill its supernatural responsibility it allows the individual members and the pastor freedom to receive instruction from the word of God rather than individuals not going through the priest it releases the local church from bondage from outside sources that would violate God's word. 
It gives the local church the freedom to ordain men and women for ministry and mission field. And it gives the church freedom to set up its own doctrinal standards according to scripture. Disadvantage of, of the independent formal government. If the pastor fails or falls, the church scatters unless a system of checks and balances are in place. The church may isolate itself from the word and, and will, will of God and other churches to the point of becoming close to a cult. That's especially dangerous now because of media ministry. A lot of ministers are thought of celebrities in addition to being ministers. You know, and people say, well, I follow XYZ TV preacher. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't some good TV and radio media ministers out there, but people can think, put them on such pedestals that they could become a cultic mentality even though they're, what they're teaching may not be cultic. Right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I know a church um, in Memphis and it just, it, they buy the pastor a new Mercedes every year and when we went to the church and they had like a three or four hundred orchestra choir and they travel and all that stuff but what threw me was the pastor had a telephone up in the pulpit and what could be so important that you're preaching the word and you're going to stop and answer the phone yeah do you ever do that Huh? Do you ever do that? Not when our church went there to visit, but he has a phone. Well, I, w- and I, thought, I will say, you know, again, I wasn't there to see it, mm-hmm. but I will say that this may be a possibility. How long has this been? Uh, well, it's, it's been several years now. Yeah. When when I was going to the Methodist church, I was I was actually on staff there. I was a security mm-hmm. worker, and um, mm-hmm. like here's the pulpit, but down next to the pulpit was a telephone, but you could get on the telephone and talk to the guys in the sound booth. It wasn't, you know, for the no. pastor to answer a call. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I understand. That, yeah. that, you know, that was not mm-hmm. for, you know, again, I wasn't there to see what mm-hmm. you referred to, so I can't say. I'm just saying that may be impossible. Yeah. I, I actually knew a couple one time that their pastor was a deputy U.S. marshal, mm-hmm. and when he preached, he had his pistol on his hip. <laughs> saying, I guess he got some big offerings. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I, 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 we, uh, several of us, we could not see that because I mean as big as that church is then you you would think they would have people in place for if something needs to be sound and sure. all that. so no I don't think it was for that well, you know again I wasn't yeah, there so I can't right. comment but yeah. Uh, yeah, that blew my mind for some reason I saw that but you know since your independence doesn't mean isolation and that's true you know I really like the term interdenominational better than non-denominational because it says, you know, we want to embrace the body. You know, not that not people who call us non-denominational don't usually mean it that way, but mm-hmm. I just think that's a more open-armed terminology. Interdenominational. We're mm-hmm. part, we're one part of the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Interdenominational, yeah. You know, we all come from different denominations. You know, I was, you know, I was a Methodist for a while, you know, others here are Baptist, others may have come from a Catholic background, whatever, but we come from those backgrounds and, you know, we embrace the good things we've learned from that, we reject any of the not so good stuff, but mm-hmm. like when people come from a, you know, say someone who comes from a Baptist church, you know, I'm sure they learned a lot of good things in the Baptist church. I, I try to emphasize that, you know, coming into the Spirit-filled life, you're not throwing away any of the good things you've learned. Mm-hmm. We all, we all have some things we have to unlearn. I'm still unlearning some things. Mm-hmm. But don't discount the truth someone may have. Like we talked about how some of the denominations came into being because they were standing for truth that the established religious body wasn't accepting. And we owe them respect as forefathers in that. Like my Baptist friends generally have a very strong commitment to the Word of God, are very passionate about evangelism, are very strong about taking up stand for moral issues. That's great. I have a Catholic friend who, um, you know, we've discussed some some of our doctrinal differences before, but when it came down to, she read me something she wrote one time about um, how it was the blood of Jesus Christ that washed her sin away and it was his resurrection that sealed her hope of eternal life. And I think, what could I add to that? I mean, that's the gospel. And she, if that's what she, if that's where she is, she's as born again as I am. And she's, um, you know, her commitment to the church, you know, going to mass every day. Obviously, I don't agree with all the symbolism to the mass, but her commitment to being a part of the body is admirable. Mm-hmm. I think, 
And you could say that, you know, Pentecostals, I consider myself a Pentecostal still. You know, that I've learned a lot of important truth into that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yes, when we come into this, whatever background comes, yes, there are going to be some traditions we have to unlearn, but keep the good things you've learned. Don't, mm-hmm. don't, if you come from a godly background, whatever branch that is, don't look down on it, mm-hmm. you know. And then, and, and like, I was sorry it was here to hear you say that because with the different people um, that she's kind of came in contact with with her schooling, and that's what she talks about mm-hmm. too. So yeah. Well, that's you know, it. I've had a lot of really good discussions with Catholics. Mm-hmm. And there was, um, if you've ever been to an Orthodox church, if you've ever been maybe to Greek Fest here, you know, the buildings, I've never actually been to a worship service in, a, in an Orthodox church, but the buildings are, and the art and things are just gorgeous. And I was talking to a man, a, an Orthodox man about that. I said, yeah, I, I really like the, your use of visuals. He goes, yeah, I hate to go to church with plain walls. <laughs> <laughs> and when you think about it, the worship in the temple in the Old Testament it was designed to engage all five senses. There was the beauty of the way it was built. There was the sound of the music, the smell of the incense. It was to engage the whole whole person in worship. And I think that's something we, we need to get back to. Bishops, elders, and deacons in independent churches. Different churches will have different roles for each again. Unless it's something the Bible specifically says is to be done a certain way. They have flexibility with that. Bishops, the Greek word for bishop is episkopos, meaning overseer, and bishops are pastors who oversee elders or other pastors. Okay, Okay, we're going to take a break here, and then we will get into, when we come back, we're going to um, start talking about the qualifications for ministry offices and what it takes to to be a part of that. What time is it, someone? It's 7.56. 7.56. Okay, let's come back at 8.10. I'll put us in. We are back. Okay. When we left, we were talking about uh, what bishops were, and we're going to talk now about the qualifications for bishops and church leaders in general. We'll be discussing some of the differences, some of the distinctions with that as we go along. Bishops are pastors called by God who are appointed to be a bishop by man. Okay, before we go into the qualifications for um, church leaders, these are the things God expects from a church leader are. Nothing that he doesn't expect from a lay person, too. Mm-hmm. What, remember what Paul said about, follow me as I follow Christ. Mm-hmm. He said that to all believers. So, any, anything that God calls a church leader to be, he calls every Christian to be. But there's more at stake when the person is in a position of leadership. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does someone want to turn to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9? These two passages say basically the same thing, but since that was listed first, we'll go with that. Titus 1, 5 through 9? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> For this reason, I left you in is it Crete. Uh, Crete. Crete. To see in Greece. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city, as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children. Not accused of this, not, this, this, okay. not accused of riot or unruly. Not accused of this, the faithful this, children. Not accused of being riotous or unruly. Okay. Uh, dispensation or, yeah. or insubordination. Okay. Um, not sure what your translation says. Yeah. For um, a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. But hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober minded, just, holy, self control, holding one through five through nine. Yeah. Um, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and do both of them. Uh, Angel, you want to take, go back to First Timothy chapter 3 and do 1 through 7. This, they, they say basically the same thing, but they're worded a little bit differently. So I want us to hit both. This is, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of bishop, he desire a good word. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, fire girl, Vil- vigilant, 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 sober, uh, good behavior given to hospitality, apt to teach, not 
not given to wine nor striker, not greedy, a filthy lurch. How do you pronounce it? Lucre, not Lucre. so much not after for money. Mm -hmm. But patient, not a brawler nor covetous. 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 One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novelist, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Mm -hmm. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Okay. We're going to take, take a look at these qualifications one by one, and I'll give you a little insight into, the, into them. Number one, their qualification is to be blameless. Now, that's a pretty loaded word. That doesn't mean you're perfect, but it does mean you're a person of consistently godly character. You know, you're a person who can say, follow me as I follow Christ. You have a safe example for people to follow. One way you can look at you, the same person on Saturday night you're on Sunday morning. <laughs> not given to once, not a drunkard. I personally would encourage you not to drink at all. I'm not saying that lightning is going to strike you if you have a beer or a glass of wine. But a, I've always looked at it if, as you're not going to become an alcoholic if you don't take the first one. You see all the crime and all the poverty in the world that goes back to alcohol and other drug abuse. Mm -hmm. I think the best way to be a solution is just to make double sure you don't become part of the problem. <laughs> and plus you've got to take into consideration, even if it doesn't affect you that way, if you're going to be ministering to people, you probably are going to be ministering to people who are do have substance mm -hmm. problems. And you want to make sure that you're setting the kind of example. You can't do a Charles Barkley. You are a role model. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And people are going to look to, uh, well, Pastor James, Pastor Angela, whatever you guys want to be, are planning to be, does this, so why shouldn't I do it too? You know, so you have to be really careful about that. Yeah, that is something because uh, I know of a church that, you know, well, if they do both, they have they serve wine and grape juice. Yeah. And I've heard of churches that do that too, that they fit their conviction is they should use wine, but if people have alcoholics or are, are alcoholics or maybe have a conviction against drinking alcohol, they'll offer that as an alternative. Yeah, and they ask him to come down front and see yeah. it. And then for one thing, you're calling that person up. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, even in Jesus' day, um, you can debate what's the kind of wine they drink, alcoholic wine. Mm -hmm. The word oinos, that is a general term, can really refer to grape juice at any point. Um, so, like when Jesus turned the water into wine, I tend to think that was probably just a very rich, non-fermented grape juice. But, but that's not to say they didn't use unfermented wine, but the thing is, in that day, clean water was very hard to come by. And what they would do is they would take the wine and dilute it down with several parts of water. and um, it would that really served two purposes. The wine would be an anesthetic to to purify the water, but the water would dilute the wine down to keep from getting drunk. And could you get drunk from drinking it? Yeah, but uh, your bladder would have something to say about it before you got to that point. <laughs> I'll just say that, <laughs> you know. But you, again, it goes back to again to the kind of example you want to set as a representative of Christ. Uh, I shared this. I, I actually talked about this with BTC uh, two last week. Charles Spurgeon, who's one of my heroes in the faith, you've heard me quote him many times, he smoked cigars. And, you know, in his day, you know, the use of tobacco wasn't, the harmful effects of it wasn't considered, wasn't as widely known as it is now. But it still was frustrating to people. And, you know, he was open about it. It wasn't something he tried to hide. He didn't consider it a sin. But um, it, was, it, it became difficult for people who would discourage their kids from smoking. They'd be like, well, our pastor smokes. Why shouldn't I? So that's the kind of thing you want to avoid. You know, not get greedy of filthy lucre, not greedy for money. And then, if that was applied consistently, there's a lot of big name ministries who go to business tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the husband of one wife. This is one that gets into some controversy. This, like, there are churches, for example, that wouldn't let me serve in leadership because I've been divorced. 
they you know they should say this means you've been married to the same woman on it consistently the rest of your life I, and ideally that's true but really that's not what it's talking about it's talk, the Greek word means a one woman man if you are married then you're faithful to your spouse I mean I'm faithful to my wife I was faithful to my first wife there were just things that happened beyond my control but you can but if this was considered a prescriptive thing for every case Paul himself would be qualified because he was single now that that doesn't mean he had been all of his life though uh, Paul apparently had been married earlier on because you know he served on the Sanhedrin and part of one of the requirements for doing that is you had to be married to have children. It's been speculated his wife either died or may have deserted him when he became a Christian. We don't know. Mm. But the bottom line is you can be single, you can be married, you can be a man, you can be a woman, but if you are married you need to be faithful to your marriage vows. You, that you have to have that fidelity. And if you breach that, that's one of the most difficult things to overcome. The, it's not a matter of forgiveness. You know, God will forgive it in a heartbeat. But adultery is a sin that carries a shame with it that a lot of times will haunt you the rest of your life. And if you've broached that, then the blameless part of the qualifications, you don't, you're not there anymore. Can you ever get that back? In some cases you can, but it's very difficult. In some cases it never happens. You remember Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of stew and it said he was never able to get that back even though he saw it with tears. So again if someone gets into that kind of a thing what he should do is repent immediately for first to God then to his wife or husband and then go to the church tell them what's up and restoration to ministry I don't think is even going to be on the page at that point. I would just say help me back into right standing with God in the church and if that comes then we'll talk about when it gets there. Are you going to say something Angela? Yeah but what about when a woman divorces a man? Again it depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know the idea that God never allows divorce under his circumstances is foolish. You know there are there were divorces in the Bible that God himself ordered in the Old Testament. You know divorce is never a good thing mm -hmm. and in an ideal world again it would never happen mm -hmm. but again there are people in my case could I have done some things different? Sure I could have but I, could, I was determined to make sure if it got to that point and it did over time mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to say with a clear conscience I did everything I could do to do that and when the day happened was it sad? Yes but I had peace mm -hmm. I've never felt condemned a moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and, and again it's people Again, divorce is never a good thing, and it's not something that you should ever seek mm -hmm. for frivolous reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when people put it, are put in situations where that's their only option, yeah. you know, some churches can be very cruel to people mm -hmm. over that. And the church I was going to, I was the, when I was in counseling with the with the one of the pastors after my first visit, when I left, he gave me a hug, and he goes, "I want you to be assured you will not be out of." grace with this church one bit mm -hmm. and that made me feel really good mm -hmm. yeah because I mean that's the same when I went through my divorce and I divorced my ex-husband but you know when you try sure. over and over and when you talk to that person and want to get counseling and if they don't want it then there's nothing else you can do well, one of the things he told me was God hates divorce but God hates dysfunctional too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and like, I'm at peace you know yeah, and you, you know, have to yeah. Sure. And like I say, I, it's, you know, like I say, if, I mean, I saw some of God's grace in my life, maybe mm -hmm. in some of the biggest ways I ever have when I was going through that time. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if you've heard a song, it came out of the Brownsville revival called uh, His Love. And I, I won't subject you to my singing, but um, mm -hmm. it talked about how your love sustains me through my life's darkest hour. Mm -hmm. And just the line of that song really got a grip of me during that time. You know. Okay, his household and children are in order. That goes without saying. If you can't be a leader at home, you can't be expected to be a leader at church, work, much of anywhere else, because the people that live with you know you better than anyone. <laughs> the old saying goes, um, your reputation is what people say about you. Your character is what God and your wife say about you. <laughs> He's apt to teach. Obviously, if you're going to be in a ministry position, you have to, be able, you have to know the words. You have to be able to share it. Not a brawler or a striker. Someone one that's not given to violence or destructive type anger. That doesn't mean you never get angry. Mm -hmm. If you never get angry, that means you have no passion about anything. Jesus got angry. Mm -hmm. 
but you don't again it's not a it's not a selfish type anger and it's not an anger that leads you to do stupid things godly behavior again that goes that saying given to hospitality he's kind to people he helps people he receives people into his home or she you know I'm using he in a general term he has a good report again he's a person who has a good reputation he's tempered he has self-control he's sober again it goes back to the wine thing he's patient he's not a novice obviously this is not something a, a new believer should do because you have to have training and seasoning to be able to do this and, and I'm glad you brought that up about novelists, novice, yeah. because I know in one of our other lessons, and it was given the definition, which is like a a novelist, and then bishop, gosh, let me get this right, because I took notes on it, because it's, okay, a bishop is, it's supposed to be with age, correct? Elders. Well, or, I mean, elder is not so much a description of age as it is maturity. I mean, a, a person may be young in age. Timothy, mm-hmm. you let no man despise your youth. He was a young man, but he was an elder in the faith. You understand what I mean? I do, and I, I just know someone, and I was just shocked to find out that they're now a bishop. And so when I, yeah, younger than me. I mean, I'm talking, and that that just threw me because when they were doing the announcement and said his name on the radio, and I was just, because I asked my girlfriend about it, and I said, but when I'm looking at this, because it, it's in our Bible study, one of our other classes, and it was given the, the uh, definition of bishop and all that, and I thought, I was just like, but he's younger than than me. Well, you know, again, not I think people get caught up because I, I mean, I know this individual really well, and he has changed from, you know, the worldly thing, and he is preaching and has has a church. But that just really, you know, that threw me to well, find out. Yeah, I was like, at that age, because I know what I had been studying, so I, I was just like, okay, so how is that? Because when I study the word and see that it says. You know this. Well, again, you know, I would need to know more about the situation to be able to comment. But um, I'll give you an example from my life. I, I used to work with a guy that was late teens, early twenties, a young guy, and he just burst through the door and he says, "James, I got saved yesterday." And of course, you know, that's happy anytime you hear it. You know, and he was really on fire, seemed to be. You know, and I went, you know, one time he came to work late because he was witnessing to a girl on the bus that so didn't want to leave it. You know. But short time after that, he started. Say, he started. This was back when chat boards on the internet were the thing. You know, and he said he started a Christian chat room, and I said, "Well, that's good." And he start, but then he starts saying, "Well, I'm their pastor." Uh, no, no, no. I said, "You, you're a pastor who ordained you, God." And I tried to explain to him, "No, that's not it." I said, "You're calling yourself a pastor. You're giving yourself something that you. Uh, you're giving yourself a sense of authority that you haven't earned." And he eventually got into some really. He eventually wound up completely turning away from Christianity and got into homosexuality. Last heard he had AIDS mm-hmm. or HIV. So mm-hmm. again, you can't. It, the thing about it is, you can go on the internet and get ordained easily. <laughs> Anybody can call themselves a minister. They can get up in taxes. But if you want to do it the right way, you got to do it. This you, this is the way you got to do it. Mm. And he has to have a good reputation for sinners. And I think this is interesting. It's not just the church you need to have a good reputation. The people you work with, interact with, need to see godly character in you. I was sharing with BTC too. There's a pastor, a fairly well-known pastor that has had some issues. Um, he's, he is under discipline by the elders in his church over some things. They said they don't believe it's something that's going to permanently disqualify him, but they do see it's something that needs to be dealt with. Well, this pastor hires a public relations firm to deal with it. He's a nationally known minister, so, you know, and a lot of, I've seen some of the bloggers that have really lambasted him for that. Now, should he do that or shouldn't? I don't know. I, I can't say. But I can see the rationale for doing it because, you know, you have to understand that you have to have the right kind of relationship with people outside the church. Mm-hmm. Again, so I can understand the rationality of why somebody in his position would see a need to do that, mm-hmm. you know. Paul mentions that bishops and deacons are separate from he and Timothy and the separate also from the saints and deacons. Okay. 
The, bishop, the office of a bishop is something a man aspires to. A bishop is an elder with greater responsibility added to him. A pastor is an elder promoted to chief elder. Again, we've already, we've already touched on that, so I won't spend much time there. In Acts 21, James is distinct, distinct from the elders because of his office. A chief, a chief elder slash pastor, he rules over the elders. The Greek word for elder is presbyteros, where the word Presbyterian comes from, as we are talking about. It means senior elder or someone mature. A pastor or minister gift appoints elders to, to his ministry staff to assist him to teach and to help govern. Most elders are minister gifts, evangelists, teachers, and pastors, but not always. Unlike the Presbyterian form, elders do not rule or govern the church. That's the pastor's responsibility. Man aspires to be an elder or bishop, but God makes the pastor. Elders assist, but they are not the pastor. And you see some answers, some examples. Moses and the elders, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Titus. The responsibility of the elder. Let's flip over to Hebrews chapter 13 and take a look at that. Chapter 13, uh, what was I? Verse 7. Someone there? Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Uh, there's a different translation. Yes, sir. Is, um, this is the New King James. Um, I have and reads, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Sure. So it's not just follow their words, but also follow their life. See what they're doing and follow them as long as their life is consistent with what they're preaching. The word presbyteros is used for both men, men and women. Women can be elders who rule and teach. And I'm really glad that they decided to discuss this because back to the old theology chat boards, I mean, they, I'm sure they're still around. I haven't really hung around them in a while, but some of the nastiest arguments I've ever seen have came up over this. And I got called pretty nasty names because for because I said I'm all for women being able to preach. I really like the way they lay this out, examples of women who are apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, deaconesses. I mean the first ever evangelistic message was preached by women who went back and told the disciples Jesus had risen from the dead. Deacons. The word the Greek word for deacon is diakonos, meaning to minister or to serve. The pastor appoints deacons to serve, not to run the church. The deacon's service in the church is spiritual. Okay, someone want to read Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6? Yeah. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in their daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the, of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word and the same pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip Pacorus I think Pacorus uh, Nicanor I mean I may, be, I may not be pronouncing these right either but. Nicanor Timon uh, Barnabas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So here you see how the office of a deacon came about. We tend to think, sometimes, and this is something we're going to get to shortly, we can have really unrealistic expectations of a pastor sometimes, um, especially when you get into larger churches, because as much as they might try, a pastor can't physically be there for everyone in all cases. And the deacons are appointed here to be an outgrowth of the pastor's ministry. 
It's not saying that caring for the temporal needs of the congregation is not important. Sure it is. That's the reason they did it. But the, the deacons minister more to the material needs of the church. Where the elders, pastors and elders in general, are deal more with the spiritual life of the church, the teaching and things like that. Both are equally important, but yeah, there's different roles. Um, okay, ministry of the word means diakonos. It didn't mean it makes sense for them to leave the word of God to deacon tables. That just means, in that case, the widows were feeling neglected, uh, that their needs were being met. But it could be any situation in the church where there are people who need special attention, people who um, are going through a difficult time, maybe sick, um, have gone through a death in their family, something like that. That that that's that's the way the church is there to serve people. They gave themselves over to prayer and to ministry, and pastors deaconed the word. The, the pastor's primary primary responsibility is to prayer and ministry of the word. Now, in the Episcopalian form, deacons are the lowest rank of ministry. I don't really like thinking in terms of ranks. It's, that they're just as important as anyone else, you know. They can serve communion to minister to the sick. In the Presbyterian form, deacons are subordinate to the elders. They can serve communion and care for the poor. In a congregational form, deacons are one of the church boards elected by the people. They are responsible for home de- visitations, care of the poor, and exert great influence over the congregation. Okay, we just read this uh, pers- this verse about deacon, about S- Stephen's office of a deacon, and it's interesting to know that uh, he was a man that had great signs and wonders following his ministry. People say only the apostles did signs and wonders. No, not true. There was a deacon here. The first deacon was a very much a signs and wonders minister. And he wound up being a martyr for Christ. We all know that horrible story about how he was stoned to death. But his face became like that of an angel as he died. Phoebe, a female deacon. Trifina and Trifosa were deaconesses. Acts 6. And let's go back to 1 Timothy. And we're going to be talking about the qualification for deacons now. First Timothy three eight through twelve. I'll go ahead and read that. I'm already there. Likewise, must be the deacons be grave, not double tugged or gossips, not given much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holy the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let them also be proved again, not a novice. Let them use the office of deacon, being found blameless, even though must their wives must be grave, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deaconess let the deacons be the husband of one life, one wife ruling their children in their own house as well. Basically, the qualifications for a deacon is the, are the same as those of an elder, except for one thing. For it to be an elder, you are qualified to be apt to teach or be gifted to teach. That's not necessarily a requirement to be a deacon. Now, that doesn't mean a deacon may not be a teacher. Like, we have some deacons in our church who are very good teachers. Deacon is caring me one of them. But I'm just saying, the office of a deacon does not require a teaching gift where the office of an elder does. Full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith in the Word, worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in wine, not in pursuing a dishonest gift. Again, we've already covered those. Keeping hold of the deep truths of the faith, first be proved, tested, being there full of wisdom, and knowledge how to use that wisdom. Again, that's important in any ministry office. You have to be tested to see that you can handle the authority you're being given. I mean, that's, if you're being promoted in your second job, same thing. Married to one worthy of respect to the husband of one wife. Okay, finally we're going to get to the pastor. The Lord Jesus Christ is our chief shepherd. The pastor is his under shepherd in the local church. The Greek word for pastor is poimen, meaning to shepherd or to feed. Excuse me. Peter is exhorting the elders to feed the flock. The word for feed is the Greek word poimen. The pastor is the one who shepherds or feeds the flock. Paul meets with the elders of the churches of Ephesus, the Holy Spirit calls them overseers, which means they are elders or pastors. Now God calls pastors, not bishops. Pastors oversee the congregation and these pastors are told to appoint in the church. So being a pastor is not something you can just choose to do like you can be a deacon or an elder. Now that may start with a desire if you are called to the ministry. Obviously one of the first things you would indicate is a desire to do it. But you have to have a special calling to be a pastor. It's not just something you could intrude it to. People who try it usually wind up having some serious problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I can't see being called by Christ to be a pastor when, when that person is not 
doing right by you know how the Bible says take care of home first mm -hmm. and then I, I can't see I can't see I know someone that's doing that. Sure. It you happens. Know, and yeah. <laughs> But you know the people, uh, you know the people who live with you know you better than anybody. Mm -hmm. And if if you are not doing it right with them, mm -hmm. again that doesn't mean you're perfect. We all make mistakes, right. you know. But uh, you you are consistent in your walk with God and mm -hmm. modeling that and leading your family that way. And and what's really sad about it about about it is you hear that person, that individual on the radio, and they know the word. I mean they sure. they know it. And I'm just like, okay, how can you sleep at night? And they may not be able to. Yeah, and that's what I, and I look at it that way too. There's got to be. You got to get some kind of. Thing. A carnal Christian is the most miserable person there is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know enough of the word to know what you're doing is wrong, but you're not doing anything about it. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, so, you know, as far as like um, the natural man, the one who's unsaved, don't know God, mm -hmm. you know, um, I guess in a the sense they have an excuse because. They don't. The Bible says, you know, they're dark, they walk about in darkness, mm -hmm. you know, they don't know. Mm -hmm. As far as a carnal man, mm -hmm. Christian saved, born again, mm -hmm. yeah, they may have the word, know the word, mm -hmm. but they're still on the fence. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, they got one foot in the kingdom of God in heaven, but one foot in the world. So it's <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. a double-minded man. Sure, exactly. He's unstable in all his way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, that's mm -hmm. totally right. I've heard it put this way, a pig will wallow in the bud and enjoy it. A sheep might stumble and fall into the bud, but his first race is going to get me out of here, get me cleaned up. Yeah. You know. And, and you know, and I don't mind, mind sharing this, because that's like with my ex-husband, I told him, you know, I said, I loved you when you were my husband, but I love you now as my brother in Christ. And he's one of those who you hear on the radio and supposed to be a minister and know nothing. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It happens. I mean, anybody that wants to go by radio time, you know. Yeah, and I thought, wow. I mean, that's deep. Yeah. I mean, that is really, really deep. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is. True. But all we can do is pray for them and True. keep on going because that's what I tell my daughter. I tell her, and both of them, the two girls, and even with, you know, Derek, I tell them, I said, you know, and, and we do, you pray for that individual anyway. Sure. And I said, you can't, you know, be angry or mad at them. I know it's at him, it's a hurting feeling, but you have to go on because you'll miss your blessing over where, you know. Sure. When, because you know he knows it's wrong. Sure. You know. But if you've done all you can do, then yeah, that's. that's yeah. Let's see. Let's see, uh, Paul meets with the elders of the churches of Ephesus, and the Holy Spirit calls them overseers, which means they're pastors. God calls pastors, not bishops, pastors over to see the congregation. These pastors are told to appoint or shepherd the church. The word pastor appears only once in the King James Version in Elder Ephesians 4 11. We've already talked about that. All other references to pastor are translated shepherd or elder. Jesus calls and appoints ministry gifts. Pastors must meet all the qualifications of every office, bishop, elder, deacon, and have a divine call on his life from God. That's important to remember. The pastor is a combination of all the offices, bishop, elder, deacon. The pastor is a settled stationary office. It's, the pastor is the only ministry gift given specifically to the local church. Now an evangelist or a prophet or apostle will probably do some traveling, some more than others maybe, but... Apostles come from the local church, i.e. Antioch and Acts, but they travel, establish churches, and minister to the whole body of Christ. Prophets come from the local church, but they are for the entire body, not just the local church. Evangelists travel for the whole body of Christ. Teachers come from the local church and travel for the whole body of Christ, or they can be teachers in a supporting role. That's kind of what I am. God calls the pastor to be the specific congregation that he wants him to shepherd. God chooses the pastor for his flock. They're God's people, not the pastors. That's another thing that's important to remember. Who is the pastor? He's an elder. He leads the flock. The leader does not share his leadership with subordinates. A leader leads. He can't share what God has told him. I'm not sure what it means by that. But a leader makes decisions and he has to take the, be willing to take the consequences for those decisions. And that doesn't necessarily mean there are bad, bad decisions. He can make good decisions, but there's still going to be some fight that goes along with it. Psalm 23, a leader also finds a, people, a place for his sheep to pastor. He leads and encourages the congregation. A pastor has or operates in the gifts of teaching regarding the instruction of the Word of God. So 
all teachers, all pastors are teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. He must feed the sheep and find creative ways for the sheep to receive the word. He brings them into remembrance of the word. A pastor gives the whole counsel of the word, and pastors are ultimately accountable to God. In fact, you know, there's as Paul said, let not many of you become teachers because they will be judged all the more severely. A, a minister will be judged by God by a higher standard than a lay person would. That's a sobering thought. He leads on the anointing that accompanies the office of a pastor. The pastoral office and call come with a special anointing that will teach, lead, and guide him to properly lead the flock. The pastor takes the oversight with the initiative and aggressiveness, not reluctantly or out of necessity. He has a fervency to protect the flock. God gives him of the heart of a pastor. He loves the flocks and will minister to their needs, sermons, home goings, weddings, counseling, hospitals, and home visits and activities. And I've been able to, to be involved in some of those things too. Um, in fact, I've been invited to do a wedding uh, later on this summer. And that's that's really the fun part of it, getting to do things like that. But there are other more uh, somber things. You're there with people at the most intimate times of their life if they've lost a loved one. I, I got to do my mother's funeral when she passed away. And uh, just being there to share with people who I've been, you know, people who are in grief at this church. I've, been, I've had the privilege to be involved in that a number of times. That's some of the most rewarding work you'll ever do. It's, it's really wonderful. Pastors must have the right motives. He's not a pastor for filthy lucre. We've already touched on that. Ministers and pastors can't have wrong motives. Ministers fall due to sex, money, and pride, or other words, girls, gold, and glory. <laughs> the three G's. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, the ultimate aim of a pastor is to equip the saints with knowledge of the Word of God. Again, we've already touched on that. A pastor is not a dictator. and Our pastor, I think, is a really good example of a pastor who has the right attitude. He leads by example. The congregation belongs to God. The pastor doesn't own them, but he takes care of them. Our pastor has really good insight into that, I believe. If the pastor has a problem with its sheep, he has, his recourse is to go to the owner, God. In the local church, the pastor is responsible to feed the flock and admonish them, but the people are responsible for what they do with the food and correction. Again, you can, you can teach people all day long, but ultimately they have to choose that they're going to live it out. I, I put a meme on Facebook that I saw the other day that says that the measure of a uh, preacher's effectiveness is not that people go out saying, what a lovely sermon, they leave saying, I want to do something. A pastor should operate in God's integrity. He should be blameless in all areas of his life. Paul sent Timothy because he had the right motives when no one else did. John 9.12 Diotrephes loved preeminence, authority, or rule and wouldn't receive John. You shouldn't follow such a leader. And that's an area, again, we talked about. It's more of a problem today than it was back then just because of this is the era of the, the day of the celebrity pastor. And again, I'm not saying that God wouldn't put somebody in that position, that there's not some good people in that area. But anything that puts you in the public eye has the attention, has the potential to pump up your ego. And the more public eye you have, the more of a risk that is. And it can be very dangerous. Demetrius is a good leader, not given to flower, to, to power. I can't, let me get a sip of water. I'm, Stumbling on my words too much, I'm sorry. <laughs> he is not a novice, he's an elder mature in the word. Okay, this is a really good hands on section. Please, thank you. You will. for your human. <laughs> thank you. Study his lifestyle according to 1 Thessalonians 5 12 through 13. Let's go look at that verse real quick. A new believer, someone who's new. I mean, that's not specifically a spiritual thing. Like if you take up a new hobby, if you start playing tennis when you're a beginner, you're a novice at tennis, you know. Just someone who's new to the faith in this instance. Okay. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. <clears throat> yeah. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you 
and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. And again, we're very privileged to have a pastor who does that. He's you know not above interacting with us. He's our, he's our friend, you know, and he doesn't try to put on airs about that. And I really have a lot of respect for him for that. The pastor is human. God calls ordinary men to the ministry. The ministry call does not make him immune from the devil or the flesh. In fact, he's got to guard against that more than ever. Ministry gifts are not superhuman. They have failures, faults, tests, and trials. You should be around your leader to know him. The idea of isolated leadership, that, that just became a real problem. And I guess it still is in some places. Preachers want to, or ministers want to cut themselves off. To, well, i got to protect the anointing. You know, that's, what's up with that, you know? <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I have no stories, but gosh, I'm just right here in town. Um, I went and visit a, a friend of mine's church, and it blew me away because the the choir was, you know, they had done their, their show, I guess. And when it was time for the pastor to come to preach, um, he walks in with his bodyguard for him and his wife, mm -hmm. and then the choir comes down, which I guess the part of the choir being in front of him, because I know it's been times at my church that my pastor has asked the choir to come down, you know, to sit with all of the congregation, but I had never seen nothing like that. Yeah. Oh. He could, and the, and the, yeah. In some cases, like if a pastor is well known, I can understand them having an entourage like that because I, I actually have seen, I've been in quite a few meetings with big name preachers. A time or two, I've seen somebody in the church that would get to where they were acting in a, I don't know that they were actually trying to physically do it, but they were coming up being really disruptive. And yeah, yeah, well, and I, and I can see that and respect that when you know it's like that, but I mean, gosh. And they call it Oma Bears too, right? Yeah, that's the one name you can call that. Okay. The, um, you know, I've been, something I've noticed, I've, again, I've been in crusades with a lot of real big name preachers, mm -hmm. and this doesn't always happen, but something I've noticed is before the last eight minutes said, they've, they're whisked away to the back, you know, so yeah. God forbid they have to interact with anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, again, I don't walk in their shoes, so I can't make a hard judgment on them. They just look... Odd to me, you're there to help you. What's wrong? Is it really going to hurt you to shake a few hands while you're there? You know? Some of the things I hear, you know, rock stars, um, you know, I'm not endorsing a lot of the things Metallica sings about, so don't, give me, don't misunderstand. One of the things they're known for is when they do a concert, they will stick around and sign autographs till the last person's gone. And, you know, if entertainers have that kind of respect for their people, What's that saying when I see ministers act like that? That bothers me. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, ultimately you're there as a servant of God. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have people, you don't have ministry. You can't just kind of, you're not just going to come and preach to the cabbage heads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah, and, and, and the reason why I made it, made it statement, because I, someone, we were talking about that, and the thing with this particular pastor is you don't call, I can't see a pastor being so, or, this is me, so busy that I couldn't call you at some given time. I mean, and, and, and the, you know, but everything, that particular pastor makes sure, and he does a lot in the community, sure. and he makes sure if you need something, if I had to, would have to go to him for something, he makes sure that you get it, but you never talk to that individual, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's why I was saying, okay, you know, you have this bodyguards and all this stuff, and I, that just that was it a large church? It's a fairly large church, but yeah. not to where I, you know, I'm on the outside looking in, but you know, just in, in conversation and to know that's how he operates. Sure. You know. Well, you know, one of the things, and actually, this is uh, something we're getting ready to uh, uh, to talk to. In fact, this kind of segues into the second, to the next part of the study. The Greek word "know" means to know about or by observation. It doesn't necessarily know about being intimate friends with the pastor. And, you know, that's not really possible that he can be intimate friends with everyone, especially when you're talking about a larger church like that. But I'm talking about, I know of people that needed counseling. Right. 
Yeah, that's different. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because, yeah. But. Like a, he does have a staff member that can do that if he can't do it personally, though, right? Or a, someone yeah, helps the ministry. How can you? How can you? And this is another thing. How can you? Your income is different from mine. Right. All of our income is sure. different. But I was just like, that is not even. I said the Bible says that you give ten percent and then a offering. Mm -hmm. Okay, he tells all the members that he wants them to give him. $5,000 for ties. And I said, you can't do that. I said, because everybody's income is different. Right. You know, I said, the tithe is 10%. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, <laughs> I'm really hesitant to speak about if I haven't actually seen it for myself. But, you know, I understand your concerns. Yeah. But, you know, think about this, you know, for all the, the huge crowds Jesus preached to, he per only person disciple 12 men. And out of that, he had his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And then even then, he had a best friend, that was John. You know, so even he had, you know, he limited. Uh, right. And I, 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 under, I understand that part of it, but I'm just, just asking. I understand. Concerns. Sure. And, you know, and, I, and I, I share your concerns. I just, I just don't feel yeah, like I'm an aggressive. I understand. Yeah. yeah. But Galatians uh, 5, 22 and 23, Luke 6, 44 and 45, look at the fruit of his life to see his character. That's very important. <laughs> we esteem him for office in which he stands, but esteem doesn't mean exalt. We exalt Jesus, and that's important to remember. We put the pastor on a pedestal and honor him because of the work he does. Now, we saw a trend, though, of, and the, again, this still happens, maybe not to the extent that it did. You, you see trends that come into prominence for a while and then kind of selects it. People got to where they were taking this to extremes too. And yes, while we give our spiritual leaders special honor, that doesn't give any spiritual leader, and I'm sure Pastor would agree with me on this, it doesn't give any spiritual leader the right to look down his nose to anyone else. There are no big eyes and little U's in, in the church. And even though, yes, our spiritual leaders are worthy of special honor, First Corinthians talks about how every member of the body is worthy of honor in their own right. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep that in mind. I honor you, I honor you, I honor everyone who's here. We respect him and should always seek ways to serve him. We should not per permit negative complaining, strife, or gossip about the pastor. Pray for the pastor, and that's very important. We need to pray for pastor several, our pastor several times a day. And our pastor and all pastors, really, we should pray for the body of Christ as a whole. Pray the word will have free course. Pray that the congregation ties as the word directs, so there will be meeting in the house of the Lord. Pray the pastor will be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Pray the pastor will preach with a bonus to make known the mystery of the gospel. Obey your pastor's teaching. Follow him only as he teaches the word. That's a big if there. The pastor's job is to admonish, to provoke the sheep to the love and good works. To provoke means to stimulate or to prod. Walk in the word of forgiveness. If you don't forgive, you'll have no priests and you may lead the church. Questions to ask when leaving the church over the fence. And this is important. Is the pastor's preaching and teaching the word of God? Are people being born again and filled with the spirit and restored to fellowship? Is the congregation prospering and growing in the things of the Lord? Are families being strengthened? Now... There are times when God will lead you to change churches. And that's not necessarily because there's anything wrong with the church you're at. It's just God may have things he wants you to learn or do mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you know. And it's important to make sure you have the right motives. To do it. Don't just get mad and go, especially without giving, giving the pastor a chance to... Maybe it was just a misunderstanding. You know? But the bottom line to ask is this where God wants me to be? What if your vision differs from your pastor's? Pray that God will help you to understand your pastor's vision and submit because there is only one vision. If you will not submit, you must leave because the lack of agreement will hinder the vision. Submit to the, submission and obedience. Submit to the authority of the church, again, only as far as they teach the word. Be subject to ministers, again, only as, much, as far as they teach and live the word. Jesus, an example of submission and obedience, he was always submitted to the Father. Evil, is, evil or forced obedience is not from God. 
care and fear is not from God. Manipulation is not from God. I will add that because that happens a lot. Good and perfect gifts come from above. Then God gave ministry gifts and they, so they are good gifts. Submission and obedience are not the same thing. Yeah, it talks about if you're willing and obedient. You can be willing but not obedient. You can be obedient but not willing. Submission is an act attitude of the heart. There is no murmuring or complaining. Obedience is an action. There is compliance with murmuring. Well, the, even if it may have murmuring and complaining. Submission is not unquestioned obedience to authority. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. That's how cults get started. I encourage you, if you have a question, if you need me to clarify something, ask me. If I'm wrong in something, feel free to point it out. I will not be offended in the least. I will thank you. Submission is willingness to follow leadership as long as it doesn't violate God's word. I, I don't mean to be redundant, but that's something I can't emphasize enough. The disciples themselves disobeyed orders disobeyed orders in order to follow God. You remember when they told them not to preach? They said, if it's uh, right for us to obey you rather than obey God, you judge yourself. God is the supreme authority. Daniel had to obey, or, I mean, sorry, Samuel had to obey God. Leadership comes from authority, delegated authority. God delegated responsibility to fivefold ministry. Yes, to rule means to shep- give shepherd like leadership. Some gifts try to rule with dictatorial authority, but that's not God's way. Let's go back to Jeremiah 34. I want us to look at that one. Eleven through seventeen, I'll read that one. But afterwards they turned and cursed the servants and the handmaids, whom they had let go free, to let them return, and brought them into subjection to the servants and the handmaids. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers the day I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondsmen, saying, At the end of seven years let go every man his brother in Hebrew, which hath been sold unto thee. No, he has served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free from thee. But your fathers hearkened not unto me, neither inclined their ear. And ye were now turned, and have done right in my sight, in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor. And you have made a covenant before me in my house, which is called by my name. But ye turned and polluted my name, and caused every man his servant, and every man his handmaid, whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure, to return, and brought again in subjection which to be unto you the servants and for handmaids. Therefore thus saith the Lord, You have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Therefore I proclaim a liberty to you, saith the Lord, to the sword, and to the pestilence, and to the famine, and I will make you be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So when people try to put people under bondage like that, God takes that seriously. God's about freedom. He's not about putting you into bondage. Now, That doesn't mean he doesn't give you things to obey, but God's commandments are not bonding. They are free. The pastor is accountable to Jesus. In the book of Revelation, the angel of the church, the messenger, or the pastor. The pastor is responsible if error enters his church, and the angel is singular, noting there is one messenger or pastor. And you see those passages in Jeremiah, I won't turn there, but woe to bad pastors. That goes without saying. Okay, communicate with your pastor. And this is something I want to share a little inside information with. Give to his support. Communicate in all things. I appreciate you. I love you. Greet him with gratitude and thankfulness. Give him an offering. Pray for him. Send cards and letters of appreciation. Communicate the same thing with his wife. Imitate him. Be faithful to follow him. Sometimes we don't realize what a difficult job being a pastor is. As we're talking about, he has the oversight of... A group of people, very diverse people. He's there to minister to their needs. Again, people have very different needs. He's expected to be there for when needed. Sometimes he can't always do that, and he has people in place that can, but that, again, that's his responsibility. Whether or not there are finances to do the job depends completely on voluntary contributions. Whether or not the work gets done depends, in our case, completely on Sometimes they're paid staff, but it's almost completely on voluntary labor. If the children's minister or worker doesn't show up, there's problems. You have to deal with all that as ministry. 
you'll have people that come through that will use you blatantly, will tell you how wonderful you are till they get what they want and then they'll throw you under the bus in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. People think that the pastor is a glamorous job. It's not. It's a very difficult, it's, it, a lot of times it's a very lonely and a very thankless job. And we've got a pastor that really loves us and is there for us the way ours is. We need to treat him like gold. Why well, God gave pastors for the maturing of the saints so the saints can do the work so we can focus on prayer and the ministry of the word to oversee, feed, shepherd, and guide the church to feed the church and be an example of Christ's likeness to be an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity to execute justice and righteousness to give rest to God's people to know and lead the people to find pasture for the people to search for the lost to lay down their life for the gospel and to serve as God's messenger Yeah, really easy job, huh? <laughs> That's, that's a pretty heavy order, don't you think? Receive your pastor as a gift. He is. Amen. Pastors are a gift to God from the church. You must take a, make a hard decision to do that. Allow yourself to be mature. When you receive him as a gift, you release the supernatural anointing of God in your life. Well, that's the end of it. Is there anything anyone you'd like to share? This is so good. Well, this is one, again, I was talking to Angel before you came in. Uh, it's, when you see church government, it's, it just seems like kind of a nuts and bolts type thing. It's not, if I was in your shoes and I saw, well, church government's not, it's, that wouldn't necessarily be a subject I get enthused about. But you really see God's heart and how he lays out the church to be yeah. Yeah. governed like that. Amen, amen. And, um, because that's exactly what it's about, you know, we are, that's what the church is, you know, we are a govern, governing body. Sure. We are really a government, you sure. know, um, because we come from a government, you know, sure. the government of God, you know, the kingdom, and once we're all, you know, all in one accord, and you know, being about our Father's business, exactly. we are conducting and, you know, releasing and demonstrating the government from which we come from here in the earth, you sure. know, so... Exactly. Yeah, this, yeah, is, this is all it. Hmm, exactly. This is it. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.